Okay, hi, it's uh, David Himmel here from Himmel Brothers Leather. Himmel Brothers is a bespoke leather jacket brand based out of Toronto, Ontario. We create custom leather jackets, some of the finest in the world. We do bespoke work. We can create jackets made to measure and the jackets are predominantly my designs. So today we're gonna discuss uh, one of the first jackets I made. I've done a piece on the Heron jacket before, but I'm gonna do one more today on this jacket that we made this month for a bespoke order for one of my customers. And one of the reasons is this is a classic, classic jacket. This one is a button front, and I believe the last one we did was a zipper front, and it's a basic black jacket. So everyone we know in leather has a preference in terms of color, makeup, design, but most people think of a leather jacket as a basic black jacket. This Heron was an original and very primitive design pre-World War II. We used to call these A1 jackets or Cossack jackets. An A1 is more of a military specification. A Cossack jacket was more of this very simple, boxy, workwear sort of jacket that you could wear at work or at night, provided you protection from abrasion, protection from the elements. And as we know, leather was the first material that people used in war protect themselves from the elements. Before we weaved fabric, probably, people were wearing skins. So this is my Heron. This one's made with black shinky horsehide leather, which is a pretty fine tannery out of the south of Japan, in Himeji, Japan. Uh, the tannery is known and renowned since the 50s for making Cordovan leather. I'm going to put a little shout out to the clothes I'm wearing before we go on. These boots are made with shinky butt, horse butt leather, which is a Cordovan tan. The jeans I'm wearing are free note cloth. And they were generously given to me from the boys at Free Note. Part of what I do with my brand is I support other brands who are friends. We often cross collaborate and we certainly help each other out. And in this time of crisis, the best thing you can have when you're running a small business is a brand friend. So, Freno Cloth made my jeans, Knickerbocker in Brooklyn, New York made my hat. I made the boots in Mexico. These are prototypes. I'm trying to break them in. I won't be making them again, but not this particular engineer model. But these boots, interestingly, are made with shinky leather as well. This is a shinky leather horse butt. So what is Cordovan? There are many, many experts in what Cordovan is, but essentially shinky is a Cordovan tannery. So they mimosa, use mimosa tree bark pulp that they bring in from Australia, and they use agitation tanks and they take horse skins and they put those skins into a solution or a liquor of mimosa pulp and in the month to two months that they're in that liquor the tannins we all hear about tannins in wine and we hear about tannins in food these organic compounds leach from the bark into the leather horse butt was the animal horse butt refers to the back end or the buttocks of the horse was the leather material prized for shoemaking now the reasons are pretty diverse but to put it into basic terms horse horse butt leather has collagen fibers that sort of travel in multi-directions. That's the fibers that make up the 
the proteins that make up the skin in the butt. And because of their multi-directional nature, their sort of swirly nature, they stretch in all directions. So you don't get a sort of misshaping of the leather. And this makes for a very fine shoe. And horse itself is an incredibly durable leather. And cordovan is the ancient process of turning those horse butts into shoe leather. So essentially you need a vegetable tan you need a horse butt, you need time, and then after the horse butt is tanned, they're processed in a very special way. So cordovan itself is the horse butt after it's tanned, flipped upside down to the flesh side, as opposed to the top side, and then polished to a bright shine. And shell cordovan are the two very swirly bits in the horse butt where the collagen fibers are sort of most multi-directional and those are two discs inside the kidney shaped leather butt of a horse. Now Shinky, like all tanneries, buys entire horse skins and the butts are used for shoe leather but the fronts are used for jacket leather. So the liquor, the tanning process is essentially the same for the jackets, the front leather, as it is for the butt leather. So while you get a beautiful leather for your boots when you're dealing with horse butt, you also get a beautiful leather for your jackets when you're dealing with horse fronts. Part of this evolution of horse hide jackets was a direct offshoot of the shoe industry. So when you look at the explosion of the American shoe industry in the 1920s and 30s, the U.S. was manufacturing millions and millions of pairs of shoes, not just for the U.S. market, but for the world market. And they were producing a good percentage of those shoes in horse leather. Americans used horses just like everywhere else in the world before cars to pull things around, and when they got old and they died, you would recycle all the animal parts and the leather industry was a major industry and horse leather was readily available. So if you were a shoe manufacturer, you would only buy the butts. Those leather manufacturers would have to use the fronts for something. And it turns out horse fronts are excellent for uh, jerkin vests, which was a military application, work coats, leather jackets, for a particularly rugged kind of use as opposed to the soft leather uses of leather jackets. So Shinky produces both the horse butts and the horse fronts. Now this heron jacket which we just made is made with Shinky horse fronts in a black pigment. Pigment as opposed to aniline is like paint so the finish is extra durable. In this case we get our leathers finished with a black pigment that is slightly softer than a regular paint finish with the hopes that on the edges of the jacket and various other locations some of that paint will rub off and reveal that rich pinkish brown natural veg tan character in the leather that's what we call t-core and we've done episodes on that what makes this jacket special is that the customer also asked for a particularly grainy leather. So what you need to know about grainy leather. Horses are animals. Each animal has different skin. Uh, when you're producing leather, you want the best, especially if it's uncorrected top grain leather, you want the best treated animals you can find. You would like them to be large, healthy, unblemished and because you're not correcting scars and blemishes if the animal is not well treated the skin's not nice it's not usable for a non-corrected full grain aniline leather or even a pigment leather when we purchase our leather from suppliers we visit all the tanneries and we make sure that they're practicing environmental and ethical practices to the best of our ability Shinky is notorious for buying some of the best horse skins as raw materials in the world and paying the most money for them. 
When those skins are tanned, different animals have different grain patterns from the life that they've led. And when I buy a load of leather, a lot of the leather will often have a lot of very smooth character, and some of it will have a lot of grain. And outside of the tanning process where you can bring grain up or down, typically a tanner will try and produce a similar finish or character to a load of leather. But in the case of these natural veg tanned leathers, they do have varying amounts of grain. So when we get a shipment in, we tend to separate out the leather into sort of grainier leathers versus smoother leathers. And that's because we don't like to mix smooth leather surfaces with grainy surfaces in a jacket. Some brands do do that. Certainly in the old days of the 30s and 40s, you would get larger manufacturers that would mix grain patterns. And sometimes that has a really cool effect, but that's not what we do here at Himmel Bros. We try to match grain. So our customers will often order a grainier finish versus a smooth finish. And if we can deliver that, we will. Now the last and final note on grain that most people wouldn't know is that when you do buy a horse front, and in our case they're split, so they're split down the middle, so it's two, it's a full front split in half. Different parts of the leather have different amounts of grain. So the leather up by the legs and the forelegs and the hind legs and the belly typically are much grainier than the back and the ribs. So if you could imagine a horse, if you can imagine this area right here, when a horse walks around, it's going to get wrinkles here because there's a lot of movement in the skin. Well, that translates into more grain in the leather. Also, typically the skin tends to be a little thinner and a little more fragile in the, say, we call it the armpit area on a human being or in the belly area where, where the horse is hanging down. And those areas you don't want to use in sort of areas of high wear where you need durability on a jacket. So when we talk about grain, we have to differentiate between grainy leather that we use to cut the main areas of the jacket and the belly or around the legs where we would use those for facing or the underarm or other areas of a jacket where we wouldn't want such a heavy leather. So that's the ins and outs of grain. So this is the A1 Heron and as you can see, because I think we have some sunshine here, you can see there's quite a lot of grain on this large back panel. That large back panel is quite a luxurious thing to have on a jacket because you have to cut that out of the main body of a whole hide of leather, which means you have to cut all the other pieces around that so you have to minimize wastage. I think I've mentioned this before but that's a characteristic first of early jackets when leather perhaps was cheaper and then of later jackets when you know labor maybe increased and it was a cost benefit analysis right faster to cut one big panel if the leather was cheaper than the labor or vice versa so the reason there's one big back panel on this is because it's a very early design and early designers, especially in the garment industry, they didn't have a standard block or a standard fit or a standard sizing method that was universal. Most people don't realize this, but people really didn't have standard sizes, 38, 40, 42, 44, as an example, in the United States and Canada until after World War II, or actually during World War II. When you were getting something made previously, say, let's say 1820, 1830, 1840, even with the invention of the sewing machine, most people were sewing at home and they were sewing their own garments. And most tailors, if they were sewing for someone, would construct the garment either on a person or on a mannequin. So they didn't have a standard sizing system. As you can imagine, when you mobilize for global warfare, 
and you had to outfit one or two or three million men and women, you needed standard sizing in order to fit those people. So previous to World War II and US government research, there wasn't really a basis for standard sizing. So let's get back to the design of this jacket. In the original Cossack jackets, because of that lack of standard sizing, jackets either tended to be overly complicated or overly simplified. And the reason was pattern makers had very personalized tricks and ways to make leather jackets work. So before the war, you often see gussets down the middle of a back or under the armpit or under the arm or two down the back. And these gussets were expansion gussets in order to make the jacket less binding on a wearer. So that was one road for personalized design tricks to make a jacket work. The other road was this very simple boxy creation. And that's what the Cossack jacket was. As you can see, the construction is not that complex. Single back panel, single waist panel, very symmetrical triangular gusset at the waist so that if your waist was skinnier than your shoulders, which most fit men, that's the case, usually there's a six inch difference, you could contract the waist down so that the jacket didn't ride up and it hugged snugly around the waist. The other feature about Cossack jackets, typically, especially vintage ones, is that they were very short. The back length was short because men would wear their pants very high. You know, when you get pants pre-1940, you'll see 17, 18 inch rises. The rise is the distance from the crotch to the top button of the waist. And obviously modern fashion, you don't have rises like that. You know, when you see old movies and you see Kirk Douglas wearing his pants right up to his belly button or above, jackets were comparatively shorter so that they would sit at the belt line. So with our design, we took that original primitive boxy design and we lengthened it a bit so it sits at the modern belt line. The first design of my heron was extremely boxy and extremely primitive and very authentic to original 30 style jackets. But I came to realize that we had to find a compromise between that very tubular shape, which I felt was a little more costumey and a slightly more shaped and fitted aggressive look that was a little more tailored so we found a perfect blend between one of my rare original jackets, that boxiness, and we found a perfect blend between one of my original jackets, that boxiness, and a little bit of shape and tailoring with this very simple cut. And how we did that, and how we did that is we created a little bit of shape to the sleeves but we left the sleeves fairly open and wide and we created a little bit of a taper down to the waist maybe two inch difference between the chest and the waist not including the contraction you can get from the gussets and that gave the jacket just a little bit more shape what we really kept true to the original was the beautiful angled shape of the waistline in the front these sort of perfect patch pockets and this very lovely scalloped collar which you might call it a shawl collar or a scalloped collar there's a, a lot of different ways to refer to it but we sort of were the first people to come out with this beautiful shape of this wide almost circular shaped collar and I think it captures that perfect balance between the primitiveness of the 30s with a bit of a more modern updated uh, fit and look. Now into the construction of this jacket, like all our jackets, we we use a 1.2 millimeter so a two and a half to three ounce uh, horse hide and where you have all these pressure points and joints 
for example, in the armpit, we skive or we shave the leather. So if you have four or eight pieces of leather joined up and sewn, it doesn't feel like a bulky knot. And we do this with all our jacket production, which is we reduce the thickness of the leather where it's over multi-layer lapping, and we reinforce it with a little bit of back stitching. And certainly uh, we use glue and tape. And this is to create a nice tailored finish, but to not have those knots that you feel when you try on a cheaper jacket and you get that bulky feeling jamming up in your armpit or around your neck. Um, the second thing is we're using uh, cotton thread on these jackets, made in America, waxed cotton button thread. And we have to go very slowly with a single needle machine. Our buttons are all hand sewn on, and in this case, we're kind of running out of them. We're down to the last year's supply, but we're using original 1930s cat eye malamine buttons that I got from a factory here in Toronto. Uh, I'm of course now looking for new buttons, so we'll probably be moving to a Japanese reproduction malamine button a year from now. This jacket differs from the last heron I did because it's button front. And what that means is it's a very simple design. Before the invention of the zipper, jackets were done up with buttons. And we have an early keyhole button machine. A keyhole basically looks just like a keyhole with a sort of a, like a skeleton keyhole. It's got a round hole at the end and a slit. And what that allows is when you do up the jacket, you slip the button through and then the jacket pulls and the button sits right in that keyhole and locks it in place. A lot of guys are unused to button jackets. It takes a while to learn how to do them up and undo them. It's a process where you pull the jacket to the back of the keyhole, then turn the button on its side and slip it through. So this is a button front heron. Again we have the beautiful grain. We have that very simple shape, and we have those beautiful dark brown original 30s buttons, and then the keyholes all the way up the front. So in this case, the customer asked the, for the jacket to be lined in a khaki cotton twill, which is a nice basic solid cotton twill, makes it easy to slip the jacket on and slip the jacket off. And that's important because if you don't have a slippery fabric on the inside sometimes the jacket will catch on your shirt so for example even if you get a wool liner you still have to have cotton lined sleeves otherwise the sleeves will catch and you won't get your arms through I'm just gonna unbutton this and show you what the inside looks like we have our new heron labels which we sort of adapted from a 1918-15 motorcycle company um, and we adapted them with a Canadian bird, the great blue heron, which I see in my journeys canoeing every summer. Ironically, uh, Shinky Leather is from Himaji. Himaji Castle is White Heron Castle, so heron themes run through all my heron jackets. So I'll show you the liner, and I think you can really assess for yourself. This is a really beautiful, simple, custom creation. Hang on a second. Turn the key, slip the button through. Slip the button through. Same process. Buttons get easier to put on and off over time as the buttonhole stretches out just a touch. There you go. There you go. Red fuzz. So that's the inside. That's a nice basic khaki liner. You often see that in a lot of. Color.